My mind has been blown so many times as I've studied Exodus and Isaiah 53 over the past few weeks. If you've attended a Messianger synagogue for a while, you know well how the New Testament portrays Yeshua, Jesus, as our Passover lamb. You also know well how the New Testament considers Isaiah 53 to be a Messianic prophecy of Yeshua. This year, I am seeing how Passover, Isaiah 53, and Yeshua all intersect with one another. It has really deepened my understanding of how the gospel is portrayed in the Bible, and I want to share what I have been finding with you today. To start, Isaiah 52 and 53 make explicit and implicit connections to Passover, such as Isaiah 52, 3 through 4, which says, For thus says the Lord, You are sold for nothing, you shall be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, My people went down at the first into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them for nothing. As we continue reading through the end of Isaiah 53, we will see more explicit and implicit connections to Passover, which we then will see also have explicit and implicit connections to Yeshua and the gospel in the New Testament. Of course, this should not come as a surprise. After all, Passover, Isaiah 53, and Yeshua's death and resurrection all have the same primary major themes of redemption, deliverance, and salvation from slavery from Egypt or sin. Exodus 14, 13 says, And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation, or Yeshua in Hebrew, of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. Isaiah 52.10 says, The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation, or the Yeshua, of our God. Matthew 1.21 says, She will bear a son, you shall call his name Yeshua, for he will save his people, that's the Jewish people, from their sins. Clearly, Exodus, Isaiah 52 and 53, and the gospel all have to do with salvation. But if we dig a bit deeper, we will see many more amazing and specific connections. Let's continue by looking at how important knowing the name of the Lord is to the Passover story, Isaiah 52 and 53, and the gospel. After it was discovered that Moses killed an Egyptian, he fled to Midian, and while in Midian, an angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a burning bush and commissioned Moses to go back to Egypt to help free the Israelites from bondage. So starting in Exodus 3.13, let's read a portion of this conversation. It says, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. God shares his name, Adonai, the Lord, with Moses to then share with the rest of the Israelites so that they know who sent Moses and who will rescue them from bondage in Egypt. Later in Exodus 6, God emphasizes this again to Moses. Exodus 6, 2 through 3, and then verses 6 through 7 says, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. God sharing his name, the Lord, with Moses and the people of Israel, ensured Israel knew who was making these promises to them and who was saving them from the clutches of the Egyptians. It is these promises on which we base the four cups of wine during the Seder, which we will return to to talk about more later in the video. These passages show that it was vital that Israel knew the name of the God who was saving them. His name is the Lord Adonai. We see the importance of knowing God's name appear as we continue reading in Isaiah 52, 
5 through 6, which says, Now therefore, what have I here, declares the Lord? Seeing that my people are taken away for nothing, their rulers wail, declares the Lord. And continually, all the day, my name is despised. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day, they shall know that it is I who speak. Here I am. Just as God desired Israel to know his name in Exodus, he continues to desire Israel to know his name here in Isaiah 52. Turning to the New Testament, we see the importance of knowing the name of the Lord really all over the place, but let's just do two examples. In John 8:58, Yeshua says, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Obviously referring back to that Exodus 3 passage in the burning bush. And then the pinnacle example of knowing the name of the Lord is probably Philippians 2, 9 through 11, which says, Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Yeshua, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Yeshua Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The importance of knowing Yeshua has the name of the Lord cannot be understated. Quoting Joel 2.32, Paul writes in Romans 10, 9 through 13, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So confessing that Yeshua is Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead and calling on the name of the Lord saves you. So just as knowledge of God's name was vital to Israel's experiencing salvation out of Egypt, knowing and calling on the name of the Lord Yeshua is vital to experiencing salvation from sin. And as a bonus, let's keep reading Romans 10 to see a really cool connection between Paul's letter and Isaiah 52. Let's pick up right where we left off in Romans 10, 14 and read through verse 17. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear it without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. To answer his own rhetorical questions about Israel, Paul quotes Isaiah 52, 7, which is right where we left off. Isaiah 52, 6 through 7 says, Therefore my people shall know my name, as we were just discussing, therefore my people shall know my name, therefore on that day they shall know that it is I who speak, here I am. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, as Paul quoted right after discussing the name of the Lord in Romans 10. Who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, or Yeshua in the Hebrew, who says to Zion, your God reigns. To note, Isaiah is introducing the gospel message here. In the Septuagint, an ancient Greek translation of the Tanakh from the 3rd century BC, uses the word euangelion for good news. Euangelion is the same word the New Testament uses for the gospel, or the good news, such as in Mark 1.1 and Romans 1.1. And we will dive into this a bit more later into the video as well. Back to Romans 10, Paul doesn't stop at quoting Isaiah 52.7. Let's again pick up where we left off in Romans 10.16 and read through verse 17, which says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Messiah. Here, Paul quotes Isaiah 53, 1, which says in full, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So here we see Paul is really marching through Isaiah 52 and 53 in Romans 10, and as you read the rest of Romans 10, he continues even into Isaiah 65. Paul is thoroughly grounding his understanding of the power of hearing the gospel and knowing the name of the Lord in Yeshua 
in Isaiah 52 and 53. All right, now let's turn back to our connections between the Exodus story, Isaiah 52 and 53, and Yeshua. All three make note of the importance of not only Israel seeing Adonai bring salvation, but also the nations of the world seeing Adonai bring salvation. Exodus 7.5 says, The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. In Exodus 9.16, God says this about Pharaoh, But for this purpose I have raised you up, to show you my power, so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. And then in Exodus 14, 17 through 18, the Lord said to Moses, And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, his chariots and his horsemen, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Clearly, God saving Israel had a dual purpose. First, to make his name known to Israel, and second, to make his name known to Egypt. Both would be accomplished by the Lord saving Israel from slavery in Egypt. Now, back to Isaiah 52, reading verse 10 and then skipping to 13 through 15. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation, Yeshua, of our God. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up, and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see, which Paul quotes this part of the verse in Romans 15.21, and that which they have not heard they understand. Isaiah emphasizes that all the nations experience the salvation brought by God's holy arm. Of course, this is what the entire New Testament is about, God bringing salvation to Israel and the nations. Just to pull a few examples, Matthew 1.21 says, She will bear a son, you shall call his name Yeshua, which is Jesus' Hebrew name and means salvation, for he will save his people from their sins, his people being Israel. And then Luke 3, 4 through 6, which quotes a prophecy which Luke sees as being fulfilled by John the Immerser, who has come to prepare the way of the Lord Yeshua, declaring an immersion of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Verse 6 says, And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Paul says in Romans 1, 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And Paul says in Romans 15, 8, For I tell you that Messiah became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Passover, Isaiah, and the Gospel all emphasize God showing his saving power to Israel and to all the nations of the world. And another bonus, if we pick up right where we left off in Exodus 14, we can see another awesome connection between Exodus and Isaiah 52. Exodus 12.33 says, The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste. Exodus 14.18-20 says, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. Isaiah 52.12 says, For you shall not go out in haste, ye shall not go in flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the Lord of Israel will be your rear guard. So first, Isaiah refers to Exodus 12 and reverses the urgency. Now Israel is not to go in haste. And then pulls from the imagery of God going before and after Israel in Exodus 14, only two verses after in Isaiah, emphasizing that 
The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. All the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Isaiah 52, 10, which follows the pattern of Exodus 14. Egypt will see God saving Israel, and God will be Israel's front and rear guard. Isaiah 52 is constantly drawing and making use of Passover imagery to demonstrate that he is discussing God bringing salvation to Israel and the whole world through the message that is being described in Isaiah 52 and soon to be pictured in the servant of the Lord in Isaiah 53. Now let's read about the importance of the arm of the Lord in the Exodus in Isaiah 53 and in the Gospel. And then a fascinating connection to the third cup of the Passover Seder, the cup of redemption. So first, let's reread a portion of a passage from earlier. That is Exodus 6, 6 through 7. It says, Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. You shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Of course, the third cup of wine during the Seder, the cup of redemption, is based on the third promise listed in verse 6. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. This outstretched arm imagery is used throughout the Tanakh, including notably Deuteronomy 26.8. This imagery appears in Isaiah 52 and 53.1. We read both of these earlier, but let's read them again with this in mind. Isaiah 52.10 says, The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation, Yeshua, of our God. And Isaiah 53.1 says, Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It is God's outstretched arm that redeems and saves Israel. We see both in Exodus and in Isaiah. John 12, 36-37 quotes Isaiah 53-1 to explain the lack of belief among the people who witnessed many of Yeshua's miracles. It says, Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. Both Isaiah and John use the outstretched arm imagery provided by Exodus 6.6 to describe God bringing redemption and salvation. For Isaiah, this is through the suffering servant, who John and the rest of the New Testament writers consider to be Yeshua. The outstretched arm passages of Exodus 6.6 and Isaiah 53.1 provide a really incredible depth of insight and meaning for us Messianic Jews during our Passover Seders. We know the New Testament likens Yeshua to being the Passover lamb. For example, 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, For Messiah, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. On our Seder plates, we represent the Passover lamb with the shank bone, which is called the Zeroah. Zeroah literally translates to arm and is the word used in Exodus 6, 6, Isaiah 52, 10, and Isaiah 53, 1. Exodus 6.6 6 says, I will redeem you with an outstretched Zeroah. Isaiah 52.10 says, The Lord has bared his holy Zeroah before the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And Isaiah 53.1 says, And to whom has the Zeroah of the Lord been revealed? So when we Messianic Jews look at the Zeroah, the representation of the Passover lamb on our Seder plate, we can remember the Zeroah of the Lord, Yeshua, our Messiah, the suffering servant predicted in Isaiah 53. And of course, the importance of a sacrificial lamb, first seen in the Passover story, is referred to explicitly by Isaiah in chapter 53. Let's read verses 7 through 12. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, 
and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah pulls from the sacrificial lamb imagery of the Passover story to describe an even greater sacrificial lamb, a sacrificial lamb that was killed for the transgression of my people and was buried and was an offering for guilt bearing the sin of many and yet will see his offspring and prolong his days continuing to live after his death and will make many accounted righteous. Of course, we know this describes Yeshua and is in fact the gospel message. We see the New Testament authors make reference to Isaiah 53 countless times, but let's read one example, Acts 8, 32 through 35. In this passage, Philip approached an Ethiopian eunuch traveling from Jerusalem who was reading from Isaiah. Starting in verse 32, it says, Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news, the euangelion, about Yeshua. Isaiah 52 and 53 is a literal account of the gospel of salvation the good news, the euangelion of Yeshua, our salvation, our Passover lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Exodus 13.3, Moses says, Remember this day in which you departed from Egypt, from the house of slavery, for by a powerful hand the Lord brought you out of this place. God repeats this instruction to remember the Exodus frequently throughout the Tanakh. We are to remember the Exodus when we put on the talus, when we observe Shabbat, and of course, when we observe Passover. And it is Jewish tradition to remember the Exodus every day. Just as we remember the Exodus every day, let's remember the good news every day. As 2 Timothy 2.8 says, Remember Yeshua Messiah, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel. If you learned something new today, like, subscribe, and share with your friends. If you like the script for this video, Shoot us an email at twomessianicjews at gmail.com. Thank you for joining us and see you next time.